This video is going to kick off our psychiatry block. And our topic today is going to be on childhood development. Now, we're going to go all the way back. You can't go any further back than the day you were born. So that's where we're going to start. So have you ever seen a delivery, they'll deliver the child and then plop it on the mother's stomach or the chest or, or give it to the dad. And that's just all to build a bond, build a connection, because they realize that affection is very important for the development of a child's brain. And you can imagine it also develops things like verbal skills. If they don't hear you talk, they won't develop those verbal skills. So affection, care, very important for mental uh, development, verbal development. And if you don't show the baby affection for a prolonged period of time, they can develop something called reactive attachment disorder. This is an unfortunate disorder. This is when the baby just hasn't been able to develop that bond because for whatever reason you're not showing it affection. And when it can't develop that bond, it won't be able to. So you can deliver that baby to another, another, I guess a caregiver and that caregiver will try and develop a bond, but it can't, it cannot react to any form of attachment. It becomes withdrawn. That's how important affection is for the mental development of a kid. Also, they realize through studies is also important for the physical development. So if you don't give that affection, they'll have failure to thrive. And they realize if you don't give affection for long enough, even if you give them nutrients, the baby will eventually die or develop very long standing, very detrimental mental retardation. So that's how important affection is if you don't show that affection or if you don't meet the basic needs or uh, supervise your kid correctly we call that child neglect neglect as you can imagine you want to report right away you'll see it in kids that are disheveled or uh, poor hygiene stuff like that so you have a high clinical suspicion and if it moves on to something further we call that child abuse abuse is some sort of maltreatment that causes harm to the kid so abuse and there are many types of abuse, there are things like mental abuse, but the ones we want to talk about is going to be physical and it's going to be sexual. So physical abuse, you're going to have signs in the question stem that will point to physical abuse. So things like fractures, which might seem not all that far fetched, kids break bones all the time, but these are, these are weird fractures, multiple fractures. At the same time, you're gonna have spiral fractures, these weird spiral fractures. So, or a spiral, multiple. So signs that these fractures aren't normal. You're gonna have um, burns and you're gonna have bruises in places that don't usually get burns and bruises. So things that aren't exposed, like if you bump your elbow or your hands, you know, things that are exposed like your, like your knee, it's, it's common. But if you see bumps, burns, bruises on things like your back or your, your bottom, things that aren't usually exposed, then you're very suspicious. And all these will be in the question stem. So I'll just write burns, bruises. And then most importantly, a dead giveaway in the question stem will be subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages. That's because of if you shake a baby in their head, basically rocks back and forth, causes that subdural hematoma and the retinal hemorrhages. Not much to talk about the retinal hemorrhages. Subdural hematomas, if you've done our neural block, then you know a lot about subdural hematomas. So can you tell me everything you know about subdural hematomas? If you can't, review my, my neural notes. Okay, so I'll write subdural, and I'll write retinal. All dead giveaways. And then what do you do? Report the abuse right away. Something you should know, Physical abuse is more commonly perpetrated by the mother. So that's physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, one of the dead giveaway is the unexplained STD in a kid. So I'm sorry, I'll just write XTD. It is more commonly perpetrated in male relatives, father, uncle, etc. So male perpetrators, that is child abuse. These are all bad things. You're not caring for the kid correctly. Sometimes, however, you can care too much. Sometimes a parent might be overprotective of the kid. Yeah. One of the things we want to talk about is vulnerable child syndrome. This is when the parent thinks the kid is, is going to get a disease or a disorder or a host of things and is illogical. Yeah. And this can be quite detrimental to both the parents because they're stressed all the time and to the kid. This can come from uh, a patient rate interaction that was normal for a long period of time and then maybe the patient had a severe illness or a severe sickness and now the pa patient's parent is incredibly worried doesn't want the patient to go to school or do these activities want, wants the, the doctor to perform all these tests 
So it can stem, it can arise spontaneously to know that. So I'll just write arise after insult. And it can be, like I said, very detrimental. They might restrict the patient from doing certain activities. They might demand um, incredibly invasive or detrimental medical procedures. They might, yes, just the way the parent talks to the patient can be detrimental to the, the patient's psyche. So this is not good either. So too much care, too little care, not good. You wanna be in that kind of Goldilocks zone. There's all the talk about caring for the patient. Let's talk about learning. So childhood learning. Before we do that, I just want to go over some terminology. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about is conditioning. Conditioning is associating something with something else. That's quite broad, isn't it? I just write association. So, if you feed a dog and you ring a bell every time you feed the dog, then that dog will associate uh, feeding with the ring of the bell. So when you ring the bell, then the dog will automatically think of it's time to feed. That is the classic conditioning experiment that is the Pavlo dog experiment. That is usually involuntary. It's just a subconscious thing that, that goes on. So it's very subconscious. Why am I talking about conditioning here? One of the most uh, prevalent ways we learn things is through operant conditioning, operant. And I don't mean learn things like learning neurosurge. I mean learning things as just, we're talking about kids here. So learning things like behavior, what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. Just general um, growing up stuff. So that's just right behavior. And we learn what to do by associating something with either a benefit or a consequence. Associate with benefit or a consequence. So your baby has no idea, it's a blank slate, what to do. So it'll say something or it'll do something. And then judging by what you do, whether you give them a benefit or a consequence, they'll know, oh, that's not right. Or, oh, that is right, I should continue doing that. If, they, if the baby does something right and we like it, we want to reinforce that behavior. So we want to say that's good, we call that reinforcement. So if a baby helps out uh, the baby's sibling or something like that, or does something nice or, or is smiling <laughs> or something, we'll, we'll give the baby praise or we'll give the baby some sort of benefit or some sort of snack or what have you. So that's called reinforcement, that's good. The baby does something bad. If the baby reaches out for like the stove or something, we wanna punish that behavior, make sure they know it's bad, stop that behavior, we call that punishment. Hey, it's not too bad. Hope that is easy enough. Now there's one more concept that I wanna talk about and that is positive and negative when we're talking about operant conditioning. These are not associated with good and bad. These are more mathematical terms. Positive means you're giving something. Positive, giving. When you give something, they, the, pay, the, the baby has like a net gain. That's why we call it positive. Negative is you're taking something away taking away. When you take away something from the, the baby, they have a net loss, that's why I call it negative. Take away. <clears throat> Again, these are not social good and bad. So let's see if we can do an example. Let's see if we can do positive reinforcement. So reinforcement is good. Positive means you're giving something. So what is an example of positive reinforcement? Let's say you give uh, your child 20 bucks because they took out the trash without being asked to. So that's a good behavior, and we're giving something positive, positive reinforcement. Let's say positive punishment. So the patient did something, or the baby did something bad, and now you have to do something positive. You have to give them something. So let's say the child broke a vase, and then you give them a spanking, okay? So positive and negative have nothing to do with good and bad. It's just giving or taking away something, all right? Hope that made sense. There's a couple of um, more examples in my notes. Make sure you check that out. Now, as with st any stimuli, you run a risk of something called habituation. Habituation, where you just get so used to 
the stimuli, whether good or bad, that you just don't pay attention anymore. So if you praise a behavior just constantly, then that praise kind of loses meaning. Or if you punish something constantly, then that punishment kind of loses meaning. So that's habituation, I'll just say, you get a less of a reaction. Those are examples because we're talking about childhood learning, but this is habituation for any stimuli. So if your alarm goes off and you just let it go off, it eventually kind of fades into the background. That's habituation. Now there's an opposite phenomenon called sensitization. This is when a stimuli makes you hyperreactive. Usually the stimuli is associated with very strong emotions like fear, anger, pain. Um, a example would be if your brother always scares you every time you like go into the kitchen, then when you go into the kitchen and he's not, even when he's not there, then you get a sense of fear. And so you're sensitized to this kind of stimuli. Those are just some terminology I wanted to go over. And that actually does it for this video. Next video, next video we're gonna continue our talk on childhood development. Thanks.